It was my first year in college, and I was the new kid on the soccer team. I passed the initial tryouts and had the honor of making it onto the team as the backup goalie. But after only a few games, I was promoted to first string. Now, being 18 years old at the time, you might imagine how good I felt about myself, especially early on, knowing that the coach recognized my talent. Uh, that coach really knew what he was doing. <laughs> at one practice, I was pleased and honored to see the coach lean into one of our players and chastise him for not playing well. And I happened to agree with the coach. These were things that that player needed to hear. I mean, buck up, get a move on or you're going to be moved out. Words that were desperately needed to be said. And for that matter, words that that player desperately needed to hear. However, the coach turned to me following that, and he told me all about my shortcomings. I, I must say that I didn't appreciate his observations as much. In fact, I, I was offended, quite frankly. His confrontation was absolutely fine when it was someone else, but now it was personal, and I didn't like it. I was taken aback, especially since I had previously, until this moment at least, really liked the coach. Well, eventually I did listen and submitted to his leadership and surprise of all surprises, we as a team ended up winning the regional championship. Now, what I'd like you to do is open your Bibles to Luke chapter four, and we're going to be looking at verses 14 to 30. It's now about a full year since Jesus was baptized. He's been doing some ministry in the meantime. Uh, possibly, in fact, this was the time he turned the water to wine in Cana. He had performed a few other miracles and his reputation is proceeding. His hometown, people are hearing about his exploits. And so when he finally comes home to visit, he's given an opportunity to preach a sermon in the synagogue. After all, he has been uh, given much practice. It's been about a year, by the way, since he had been baptized. And so he had been speaking a lot. He'd been uh, preaching a lot. He'd been teaching a lot. And now the people from his hometown have been hearing about this. Now, at the start of his message, everyone's amazed by the wisdom and the graciousness of his teaching. But very quickly, they become offended. This hometown boy who they liked a lot before this, they're now not so keen on. You see, Jesus was getting too personal. He was leaning into them. He was saying things that confronted them directly. And their opposition and their rejection bursts up. They liked it so much better when he was saying things they liked. And for that matter, saying things out there in the other parts of Israel to those people who needed to hear what he had to say. But now he's saying things that disrupted their lives at least uh, in their mind, uh, a little too much. Here's a question. How about you and me? Most, if not all of us, are good with Jesus when we hear him say things, the things that we like to hear, when we see, uh, hear him say great things like love others, be kind, or things like God so loved the world that he sent his only son. I mean, that's great to hear that. Or come to me, all you who are burdened, and I'll give you rest. I mean, I like that one. But what happens when he says things we might not like so much? You know, those things that get in your face, things that step on our toes, things that get a little too personal. Things like forgive that person who wronged you and love that person who treated you so terribly. Really? Yeah. But, but you don't know what they did, Jesus. Uh, the way to God is narrow. You must be born again. I mean, th he doesn't really mean that, does he? God, I mean, God's going to see my good side, won't he? Or renounce all your possessions. Uh, but come on, Jesus, that's my house. That's Or my car. That's my bank account. I've worked hard for it. Or what about don't forsake gathering together a lot, especially since I'm coming soon. Well, I, I know, Jesus, that's important. And it's really important for other people and my kids. But you got to remember, Jesus, I got other things to do. I have so many other priorities. You can probably add your own hard thing to hear from Jesus. And, and, and there's probably as many hard things to hear from Jesus as there are people in this room times a hundred. But the question is, what happens when he says things that you or I don't like? Well, in Nazareth, we find a group of people who found the words of Jesus just too hard to accept. But in their unwillingness to accept his words, they'd end up losing out in the end, ultimately left without the presence of Jesus. And you know what, church? That's a devastating thing. Because living in the presence of Jesus is absolutely essential to a thriving Christian life. It's only as we walk in the presence of Jesus that we'll have the power to resist the passions of the flesh. Victorious Christianity isn't found in knowing a lot of theology or manufacturing the right kind of feelings. It's found in abiding in the presence of a person named Jesus. So my prayer for us today is that we not be like the people of Nazareth and instead 
that we would live in and abide in the presence of Jesus. Now, in this passage from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 30, there are two key points I'd like to draw out for us, and and then a question about how we're going to respond to the message we've all heard. Now, the first key point is, is to accept Jesus for who he really is. The second point is recognizing Jesus as Lord and then submitting to his lordship. So, so first, accept Jesus for who he really is. In verse 14 to 16, we read these words. Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was teaching in their synagogues, being praised by everyone. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. All right, so it's at this point that the people in Nazareth have been hearing about Jesus, and they're proud of their hometown boy who is becoming quite famous. It's funny how that works, doesn't it? The hometown boy makes good, and we become proud of the association with that hero. In fact, it seems to elevate our city's reputation. Cole, Cole Harbor and his people are, are pretty special. Why are we special? Because we have some guys that lived in our town who the world knows who they are. We have our very own Stanley Cup champions. I mean, Joe DePenta, Sidney Crosby. Um, who's the other guy? Nathan McKinnon, yes. And and you know what? We can feel like we can share a little bit of their fame with them. We've won that Stanley Cup because of them, vicariously through them. Uh, we even put signs up to the entrances uh, of our community to let everybody else know that they're entering some kind of sacred place, right? With our hockey stars, we not, might not even cheer for the teams that they play on, but but we still kind of, what do we do? We claim them as our own, except for Corey with Nathan McKinnon. But but the rest of us do. And, and when we hear that they're back home for a visit, even that makes us feel special. They're back home. They remembered us. They haven't forgotten their roots. They haven't forgotten about us. Though we might feel a little miffed that they hold their victory parade in Halifax instead of Cole Harbor, uh, even still, we're okay. With that, they're home. In that light, I think you might be able to understand just a little bit, just a little bit of what was going on in the town of Nazareth at that time. A town of very little reputation. Not much was happening in that community, but now one of their own was famous. And today, the word's out. He, he, he's coming home. Everybody would have been talking about it. Everybody would have been anticipating his arrival. The, the air would have been electric and possibly because of his fame. We don't know, but uh, it would probably be as a result that when he finally arrived, they present him the opportunity to give the sermon. So what did Jesus do? He took that opportunity. So he stood up and he read from Isaiah 61 which is perhaps probably the most important of over 2,000 Old Testament prophecies that point to the coming Redeemer and the Messiah. Let's take a look at verse 17. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. What was going on there? Why was he even sitting down? Now, in our church, when somebody comes up to read the scripture, as as uh, Spencer did already, they'll read it. Then they'll go back and they will go sit down. And then when they're finished, the preacher, in this case, myself, will get up and we'd stand here and we'd preach to you in front of everybody and give you the message. But that wasn't the case here in Nazareth during that time throughout all the land of Israel. When the preacher sat down, it, it was signaling the beginning of the message. That's how they did it. They'd sit on a chair or a bench and the rest of the people then would sit on the floor at his feet. In fact, that's where we get the idea of sitting at the feet of a great teacher. In any case, Jesus sits down, signaling that he's about to begin his sermon. I mean, this is their famous home boy, hometown boy coming home. So all eyes are going to just be fixed on him. They're going to be leaning in, going to make sure they listen, going to make sure their phones are off. 
They're going to make sure that no beeping's going on and no cars are honking their horns outside. And they're going to ask the question, what's he going to say? I mean, we know this guy. We know Jesus. We've watched him grow up here in Nazareth. And he's been gone for a while. He's been living in Capernaum. And, and you know, they've heard all the rumors and the stories and the incredible ministries performed, doing the miracles and the healings and, and the speaking to multitudes all throughout the land, all that kind of stuff. Pretty exciting stuff. And especially he's doing that in Galilee. Now, now he's going to preach in his hometown synagogue for the first time. So every person in that crowd was, would have been leaning in. Their eyes fixed on him, their ears listening intently. What's he going to say about this prophet Isaiah? What a great passage. Love that passage. What's he going to say about it? And Jesus looked out at the congregation, peering at him relentlessly, and he began saying to them, and we see in verse 21, today, as you listen, the scripture has been fulfilled. Pretty short sermon. Don't you wish he had been there? Right? It was like right to the point. Now, you have to understand that the people of this nation have been reading the, this prophetic agenda for hundreds and hundreds of years. They, they've been waiting generation after generation that, and uh, uh, for the Lord's, Lord's anointed, the Lord's deliverer, the Lord's conqueror to come. Now, Jesus tells the people in front of him today that he's here right now. You're looking at him. You're listening to him. We can't say for sure, but Jesus probably expounded more on the phrase from Isaiah 58 during his sermon, and then Luke only summarizes it here in verse 21. I think that because, uh, first of all, many commentators have said that about that, but it also appears that uh, when you look at it, uh, uh, Luke states that Jesus began to speak, and the people mentioned his gracious words in verse 22. So this implies that he had said much more. They were all, as it says in verse 22, they're all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet they said, and this is interesting, isn't this Joseph's son? The point is that the initial response to Jesus was quite favorable, to say the least. They're speaking well of him and were amazed at the smooth manner that, uh, that he, in which he was able to communicate. As sermon critics, they're kind of giving the hometown kid, you know, the good marks on his delivery and style. Uh, very quickly, the nodding heads begin to stop and, and approving smiles turn to frowns. I mean, isn't this Joseph's son? Hmm. Uh, who does he think he is, really, make, making these claims about fulfilling this scripture? I mean, Jesus is making a staggering claim, not one that they were expecting him to make. He's saying that Isaiah's words written over 700 years before apply to him. And, and not only that, but he's saying that they don't have any grounds to debate him on this claim because he's speaking and he's acting under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And he says that in verse 18. In other words, he, he didn't come uh, out, out of his own initiative. He was sent by the Father to bring salvation to the world. That's a pretty big claim. Further, he states to not only be preaching the gospel, that that's something we all do or should be doing, by the way, as well, but, but he's saying that he's the one bringing it to pass, that he's the one setting free those who are oppressed. What? Jesus? Joseph's son? In Isaiah, by the way, the year of the Lord's favor is a reference to the Jewish year of Jubilee where debts were released and, and, and slaves were set free. And, and it, it's really a spiritual picture of the day uh, or time of God's salvation. So what Jesus was saying here, or what the, uh, what the people heard, though they didn't accept it, was that he wasn't just proclaiming the good news as God's appointed prophet. You know what he's doing? He's saying that he is the good news. The one who would offer himself as God's sin bearer. The, the Lamb of God is him. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one to make this year a jubilee happen. No other prophet has been able to ever say that. Then Jesus comes along to little town in Nazareth, and he declares this to them. You don't think that would have made a shocking surprise? <sighs> Right at this moment, the synagogue became more crowded than only moments before because suddenly an elephant appeared. The elephant in the room was that if he was the Messiah, they'd need to submit to his authority then. 
If he was truly God's son, they'd need to worship him. Joseph's son, yeah, they're going to have to worship him if he is who he says he is. If he was who he claimed to be, they must give up their own lives and follow him as the only source of joy and satisfaction and purpose and, and, and provision. However, though the people accepted him as Joseph's son, they refused to recognize him as God's son. They didn't see Jesus for who he really is. Let's not miss that. Because I wonder if we do that. I mean, we say we like Jesus. We, we like his vibe. We even like quoting him, don't we? Do unto others what you'd have them do unto you. Or, or, or peace I live with you and, and, and my peace I give you. That sounds so good and, and great. And th those are words he says. We, we love this idea of him being our best friend, our buddy who's there when we need him to help us feel better about stuff. He's the friend who's always positive after all, isn't he? He's always given the thumbs up. I've seen those memes. I mean, that's Jesus. He, he's all about love and peace and helping out the poor and the needy. He's the guy who makes me feel good about myself. He, he, he's like our hometown boy making good. Jesus, let's do a selfie, right? But we have, <laughs> excuse me, but we have to see him for who he really is. God made flesh, God's only begotten son, and seeing him for who he really is, the question then becomes, do we then submit our lives to him or only the parts that suit us? Do I pick and choose? Listen, church, to, to, ex to accept God's good news, we must accept Jesus as he really is, as he claimed to be, as Lord and Savior. If you and I accept him merely as, as a nice prophet who helps us to be happy, who has some nice words and sayings that we can quote, but we don't submit to him as Lord, we're not truly accepting him for who he really is, no matter what we say. Jesus came as God's anointed Savior and Lord. We must accept him as he really is. But then, but you see, church, but then when we see him for who he really is, there's something else that we have to do. We must then submit to Jesus as Lord. Look at verse 23. Then he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, doctor, heal yourself. What we've, heard, uh, what we've heard that took place in Capernaum, do here in your hometown also. He also said, truly, I tell you, no prophet is, is accepted in his hometown. The skeptical spirit in the, in the room was in stark contrast to the reception that he had been receiving already throughout the rest of Galilee at, at this point anyways. The issue at hand was that though there was no faith in the room, no openness to the spirit. We learn in Mark's account of the same event that Jesus could do no great miracles in Nazareth. Why? Because of their lack of faith. In response to their lack of faith, Jesus would quote a, pro uh, uh, a proverb, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I mean, think about it. The hardest place to preach is among those who think they know everything they need to know from you or, or even about you. Many of us have experienced that kind of, of reception when sharing Jesus with our family or longtime friends, haven't we? You know, we know you. We know all about you. We know your faults. You think you're better than us? We've probably experienced some of that. So at this point, the people are a little offended. But what really threw them into a rage was when Jesus next referenced two Old Testament stories. Let me read them to you. Starting in verse 25, but I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's day when the sky was shut up for three years and six months while the great famine came over all the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them except a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. And in, and in the prophet Elisha's time, there were many in Israel who had leprosy and yet not one of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They got up, drove him out of town, and brought him to the edge of the hill that, was, that their town was built on, intending to hurl him over a cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. So this first reference, what it's talking about is God using Elijah to proclaim a drought over all of Israel in response to the wickedness of King Ahab and, uh, and his wife Jezebel. 
During this time, God sent Elijah to the uh, neighboring uh, country of Sidon where he encountered a widow who was picking up sticks. Why was she picking up sticks? Uh, she shared with him that she uh, was making a small fire to bake the very last amount of, of flour and oil into two small cakes for herself and her son, and then they would die by the, in the next couple of days because that's all they had. They're going to starve to death. And so Elijah, what does he do? He instructs the woman to make something for him first. Sounds bizarre and weird. Like, yeah, okay, I know you. that's all you got, but I want it. Well. I mean, that's a big ask, but she did it. And still there was enough for, uh, enough for her, her son. And the same thing happened day after day after day after day. The, this Gentile widow received a blessing by serving this Jewish prophet. She had a lot more than two cakes. The other reference is about the prophet Elisha, who came after Elijah. During his, during his ministry, a guy by the name of Naaman, uh, he was a Syrian general who had uh, leprosy. Uh, he comes looking to him for healing. Naaman traveled in desperation to find Elisha, uh, who he had been told would heal him by a slave girl who was living in his home at the time. But when he finally arrived, Elisha didn't come out to meet him. Instead, he sent word that he should just, you know, go jump in the Jordan River, dunk yourself seven times, and, and you're going to be healed. And Naaman was quite offended about that because he, you know, this guy's a pretty high mucky muck within the Syrian army. And so he he felt that at least come out and see me. I got lots of money. I'll give it to you. Get, you know, say some kind of a, uh, some kind of enchantment over me. But but, you know, he's about to go home and his servant convinces him, in fact, begs him to reconsider. And uh, so Naaman finally puts his dignity aside. He plops himself in the water of Jordan seven times, plunk, 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 I don't know how many times. And on the seventh time, he comes up healed. Now, in both of these stories, Gentile outsiders, here's the point, Gentile outsiders get the blessing because they responded in faith and obedience. Gentiles are those who are not Jews. That would, in, in this case, probably be most of us, if not every single one of us in this room, those who are non-Jews, Gentiles. In the gospel that Jesus would bring everyone, here's the point, everyone, regardless of lineage or religious background, would be eligible for salvation. They only now, doesn't matter who they are, need to respond in faith and obedience. The very thing that these folks from Nazareth refused to do. You see the linkage? How he brought that together? Jesus is a master communicator. Now, in their minds, though, Jesus had just gone too far, implying that he's going to take God's blessing to the Gentiles of all the nerve. Now, it's personal. Them's fighting words. Crowd in Nazareth believed that they had the corner on, the, on God's grace to the world's market. But Jesus is letting them know that God can and will sovereignly choose he'll, who he'll give mercy to. And, and that no one, no matter the family they're born into or the status that they hold, can demand his grace because all of us, every single one of us, Nazarene, uh, Canadian, Gentile, Jew, are undeserving sinners. If God chooses to go outside of Israel and give his blessing to a widow in Sidon or a general in Syria, well, withholding his blessing from those in Israel all at the same time, he's free to do that. But when they heard that, that deeply offended them. The word of God, you see, confronted square on their self-righteousness. They thought that they were the only ones to receive God's blessings. They, you see, they, they did understand some of the scripture. They understood the promise uh, made to Abraham as a blessing for, for them, but they understood it more as a blessing for me, curses for thee. But what did God really say? Is that what he said? Let's take a look at Genesis 12, just for a moment. Verse one, the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. It's about God doing all these blessings. You notice that? I will bless, I will curse, I will send you, I will make you, I will, I will make your name great, I will make you a great nation. All of these things are God. Now, Israel, throughout the generations, including the people here in Nazareth, accepted the part about being specially blessed and chosen, but they forgot the big picture. 
God wanted to bless the entire world through them. In, in fact, they were blessed. Why? To be a blessing. They missed that part. But they're so outraged. I mean, that they want to kill him. It, it's a homecoming gone bad. At, at this point, Jesus let them lead him as far as the edge of the cliff, of course. And, and, to, and, and, and I think it's to reveal the murderous intent of their hearts. But then he walks away from them because his time to die hadn't come yet. This is another example, I think, that just shows Jesus was and is always in control. Bryce is going to unpack that a little more for us next week. The people of Nazareth said that they believed the word of God. But when they were confronted with the living word himself, imagine this, declaring the truth of the gospel, what did they do? They dug in their heels and they held to their comfortable belief that they were the special people of God instead of submitting to the revealed truth of who Jesus is. This declaration, I am he, was a light really that shone into the dark corners of their souls and, and, a, and a showcased their hypocrisy. It's easy to point the fingers at them, though, church. What about me? What about Steve? What about you? What about us? You know, it's easy to hear that God loves us and that Jesus cares for all of our needs. And by the way, that, that is true. So we welcome into our lives. But, but do we begin to get a bit uncomfortable when we realize that Jesus' teaching is also going to confront our, our pride and, and our self-righteousness? I find it interesting that rather than building up our, our self-esteem, Jesus isn't one of these self-help gurus. Instead of building up our self-esteem, Jesus begins shining the light of his holiness into the dark, hidden closets of our soul. That can be a scary time. It can be also a revealing time. When we begin to see that nothing good dwells in our flesh, we have a crucial decision to make. We can dodge the hard truths of the Bible could do that either by throwing out the whole thing as some people do or as many others do you know simply just go find another church that uh where i can hear some soothing comfortable messages things that aren't going to challenge me or we can choose god's way and face the hard truth about ourselves and we could then do this submit to jesus as lord i think it's a good question to ask then if we do that what kind of lord is jesus He's the kind who not only deserves our obedience, but he wins our admiration. He's not a selfish Lord. He's a self-sacrificing Lord. He's not a mean Lord, but but a kind one. He's not the insecure, cowardly Prince John who opposed Robin Hood, but but the winsome, uh, magnanimous King Richard. A king for whose return his subjects longed, if you know that story. He's not a lord like Scar, but like Mufasa. Not Denethor, but Aragorn. Not the White Witch, but Aslan. He's not just the hometown boy who made good. He's the boy who grew up so that we we can be made good. He's the kind of lord who's also our greatest treasure, a lord so good that we would sell all that we have to be his glad servants, giving ourselves to the treasure that he is. He is our pearl of greatest price. Not only have we seen that he's powerful, but we tasted that the Lord is good. He is not a Lord we disdain, but one that we admire. He is a giving Lord, not an exacting Lord. He is the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. That's the Lord. This is our Lord that we would submit to. This is who Jesus really is. Well, that begs a question. What's our response? So just for a moment, I just want you to sit there in your imagination and imagine yourself sitting there on the floor in the synagogue. And and now you've heard the text. You just heard the word of God being read to you. And now you hear the son of God. You hear Jesus say, I am he. What's your response? Do you leap for joy and say, thank you, God. We've waited so patiently. Do you want to run up and hug his neck and say, we're so glad, Jesus, to know that you're the Messiah? Is that, is that how, how you'd respond? 
you know, sadly, the reception of Jesus and his kingdom uh, that the people of Nazareth uh, gave Jesus is far too often true of us, I think. I've been guilty of this. This is why I can share this so passionately. I mean, we're happy to observe and speak well about and even praise him. Hypothetically, Jesus and his kingdom have our full support uh, until the message becomes personal, until Jesus steps on our toes, until the kingdom of God clashes with, with us. And then we become offended or, or even enraged. We justify ourselves, we defend our possession and, uh, position, and we wonder, uh, how dare he? Or he didn't really mean that. Now, some people will storm off to a new church. Yeah, I get that. Some reject orthodoxy altogether and call together a version of Jesus who endorses or at least tolerates the things that we like. But that's not really Jesus. If we make that move, we're no longer loving and praising and following Jesus. We've thrown him off a cliff. We'll throw in our lot in with the devil. You know, the clash of the kingdoms is on us. That means it'll frequently clash with you. It'll frequently clash with me. What will you do when it does? I'm going to have some uh, questions on here, a couple points on here, just for the next couple of few minutes as worship team comes, comes on up. I want you to consider your response. Where have you not accepted Jesus or believed Jesus for who he really is? So spend a, uh, spend a, mo- a few moments uh, before the Lord. And, and if he identifies, he shines a light in an area, repent where you haven't accepted him for who he is. And secondly, submit to him as Lord if you have not done so in the past. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. This is the time to accept him as Lord and Savior. And maybe that might even mean resubmit your life again, once again, to him as Lord. 